Our topic today is on the judgment and the guilty. As I've learned from a few visits with you, it's very easy to misunderstand what I'm telling you this week. And I knew that before I arrived here, but I feel the needs are so great that it's worth all the risk of being misunderstood. If you misunderstand me, or think you misunderstand me, please come and see me. You may even attack me. I don't care what you do. Criticize me. Anything. It'd be so very, very nice if we could just sit and talk together for hours about some of these things so we really comprehend the other person. It's most difficult to communicate in a monologue like this, and I know that. But we just don't seem to have the time with a heavy school schedule you have and a heavy work schedule I have. Now, this is another one of those controversial topics. If you are an average Adventist with any habitual sins, the traditional teaching about the investigative judgment about drives you up the wall, doesn't it? In fact, it's probably one of the most detested teachings we have if you're suffering with guilt. For it makes you cringe when we read that we're going to be judged by every idle word that men shall speak. And every word shall be brought into judgment. And you know the text we use. How do you feel about this? Now, I think that the devil would like to distort every good teaching we have. I wish you'd sit and look at the judgment with me just a few minutes. First of all, we understand it takes place in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And there is found the law that condemns us and makes us feel guilty. The Bible says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, in the 77th Psalm, in verse 13. If you just take a little tour with God and approach unto the most holy place, you'll discover some amazing things that we usually leave out in our teaching about the law and being judged by the law. I want to take you on a guided tour. As you enter, there's a huge altar there, the altar of sacrifice, the death of Christ for your sins and mine. Just beyond it is the labor, the blood of Christ cleanses or washes us from all sin. Then you enter the tabernacle, and on your right is the table of showbread, his broken body, the goblets of wine, his blood poured out. On the left, the seven-branched candlestick. I'm the light of life. I know you're destined to die because of your sins, but I come to give you life. And there that olive oil that makes the lamps burn comes from green olives beaten, the sufferings and beatings of Christ, that we might not have to die. As you continue on, there's the altar of incense, that golden altar of his perfect righteousness, the merits and intercessions of Christ, because I have no righteousness apart from him. I enter by his righteousness. And behind it is that glorious veil, rent from the top to the bottom, which Paul tells in Hebrew symbolizes his flesh through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, his crucified flesh. And the only way you can enter that most holy place where the ark is found in the law is with incense in one hand, his righteousness, and blood in the other hand, his death. And as you approach there, the golden cherubim, the ministering spirits sent to intercede and work for human beings that they might be saved. And over all of the ark, that tremendous mercy seat, the marvelous grace and mercy of our loving Lord, the first attribute of God's character. When you finally lift the mercy seat, inside you can find the law nestled between two other objects, Aaron's rod that budded, the resurrection power for those that die. And on the other side, a golden pot of, pot of manna, God's provisions that we might live. And after all of this, you can find the law. If you present it any other way, it's a perversion. Do you agree with me? If you leave out all that procession of mercy for sinners, the law is a perversion of truth. And we usually present the law and the law only and leave out all the rest. Or we put them in studies so far removed from the law that we can't remember the mercy any longer. I contend that Adventists have taken the law out of God's context in the judgment. And it makes us all have a very different idea about the judgment. One thing that gives us the most trouble is the Bible teaches in Revelation 22, verse 12, that every man shall be rewarded according to his works. And this worries us and begin to get concerned about our works since we're judged and rewarded according to them. 
Now, I want you to look at some of the works and the rewards in the judgment. And this is taught by Jesus in some of his parables. And Luke 15 is the first parable I'd like to refer to. And please read with me verses 28 to 30. You know this parable very, very well. It concerns the prodigal son and the prodigal's brother. And I want you to listen to the argument of the prodigal's brother after his brother had come home to a great feast. Verses 28 to 30 of Luke 15. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Notice his works. I never violated your law. Yet thou gavest, never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Can you love a father like that? Think now about this. The worthless, good-for-nothing son who wasted all that his father had given him as an inheritance comes home and they make a joyful feast. The fellow who stayed home and did exactly what his father required of him all the time, kept his nose to the grindstone, labored away all those years, never had such a feast. And he wouldn't even go inside. He was so provoked at his father's mistreatment of him. Do you think the father was fair? The prodigal's brother said, Dad, you're not square with me. You're cheating me. You're depriving me. And I don't like it. Why do you do these things for worthless, guilty, good-for-nothing people? And I'm the one who's been so faithful and righteous, you did nothing for me. Why? Now, while you're mulling over this inequality that seems to appear there, turn to Matthew chapter 20 and read another one like it. Verses 8 to 15. And you'll quickly recognize this is the parable of the laborers. And it tells about the ones who are called the first hour of the morning and labored twelve hours and the third hour and nine hours and so on until finally some are called the eleventh hour and worked one hour. And as they came to receive their wages, they all received one penny, which we understand was very good wages for twelve hours' work, extremely good. But those who worked a long time expected they would receive more since those who worked one hour received a penny. And they complained about this. And the Lord talks to them there in that chapter, and he said, Isn't this what you agreed to? May I not do with my own what I please? He said, I don't do you any wrong there in verse 13. Didn't you agree for this? And he said, Take what is yours and go your way. Isn't it lawful for me to do with mine own as I please? Is your eye evil because I am good? And so it seemed there's an inequality here. Now you say, well, it was legal. They agreed to that, you know. That was the bargain. So you can't accuse him of being illegal in this matter. But if you leave out legality and talk about fairness, was it fair? How would you like to have been the ones who worked 12 hours and received the very same wages or the same grades as the one who worked one hour? How would you like that? The teacher would be just, you know, harassed with your criticisms if that's the way we did things. It's unfair. I don't like it a bit. Now, Christ is describing some things for us that we have difficulty understanding in these two parables. These are illustrations of God's dealings with us. And you must perceive the deep meaning of these things or you misunderstand God. Now, if you add to this that we're rewarded according to our works, were the laborers rewarded according to their works? Was the prodigal rewarded according to works? Was his brother rewarded according to works? Come on now, help me out. It doesn't appear that way. Now, you're going to have to look at works a little longer than we have been looking in the past. When the Lord says reward according to works, he has a different meaning than most of us have thought. And the reason why you feel so guilty sometimes about poor works is that you do not understand the kind of works he's talking about in these two parables, which are so important to us. Now, how do you explain this dilemma between the prodigal and his brother and the idea about the wage earners? The Jews said about the Lord in Ezekiel 18 and verse 25, the Lord's ways are not equal or fair. They charged God with that. And the Lord answers to them and he said, are not my ways equal and yours unequal? 
he turns right around to us and he said, you're the unfair ones, I'm the fair one. Now it seems from these two parables that the Lord is unfair. But he really is not. If you study it carefully, you understand why. Now there's a another parable in Luke 17, verses 7 to 10. And it has very difficult language in the Bible, but it's not that complicated. It's difficult for us to accept, but it's not complicated. Luke 17, 7 to 10. I want to throw this all together in the hopper before we sort out the pieces. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle out working in the field, will say unto him by and by when he's come from the field, go and sit down to meat or to eat, you see? Will not rather say unto him, make ready with what I may eat or sup. Make my supper first, and gird yourself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken. And afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Which will he do? Serve himself and eat first? Or will a servant take care of his master, and then after a while, when he's finished, take care of himself? Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, or I think not, he says. Then verse 10. So likewise, the conclusion of this, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you. Remember the prodigal's brother? I've done all your commandments. When you've done all those things which commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. When you've kept all the law and all the requirements of Adventism, we have many of them, you are to say, we're unprofitable servants. We are only do the, have done the things as our duty to do. Get no blessings from that at all. In the commentaries, the commentators discuss this in volume 5, page 838. This is not Ellen White, by the way. That is, we deserve no special commendation. The master has received his due from them, but nothing more worth mentioning. He has not profited by their service to the extent that he should feel obliged to show them special honor. They have their wages. That is all they should expect. When we have done our best for God, we do not thereby place him under any particular obligation to us. We have done no more than by right we should do. Now, this is a little bit different teaching than those who believe they can earn his favor. When you've done all this right, you're to say, I'm an unprofitable servant. You're not obligated to me at all. You see, the big question in all these parables, is God indebted to us or are we indebted to him? Do you serve God expecting him to pay you because he's obligated to you or to make him obligated to you? Or do you serve God because of an obligation to him? Is the judgment concerned about God's obligation to us, whether or not we're deserving? Or is it concerned about whether we have shown our gratitude and paid our debt to him? It's a vastly different thing, whichever way you look at it. Now, the worst problem we have with this is accepting this idea that we're guilty and that we're sinners. See, the wages of the sin is death. All have sinned all guilty. If the Lord deals with us according to what we deserve, what we've earned, we'll all die. And you better get out of the area in a hurry of what you deserve. And I better too. You can't stay there very long. Whatever we deserve is bad, sour grapes for all of us. Just don't, that's not what I want. Do you? I don't want the Lord ever to deal with me according to what I deserve. Never. I'll never get good enough to deserve something better. And so I don't want to be dealt with according to wages or merit. Leave that out. And I'm thankful the Bible has some marvelous texts. And I wish you'd write these down. Psalm 103.10. You'll need these sometime when you get very, very discouraged and depressed. And those who don't ought to study them to find out what's wrong with them too. 103, verse 10. He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. There's a huge word in there, not. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. This is talking about the way God deals with people. Not according to your sins. Does not reward you according to your iniquities. Now this is in a clash of reward according to our works. If our works are sinful and God does not reward me according to my iniquities, what's it talking about in Revelation? We must really confront ourselves with these apparent disagreements in the Bible, for if we do not harmonize them, we usually accept a falsehood. 
And because it stretches our brain muscles a little bit, we don't like to sit down and labor long enough to find out what the clash is all about. It's usually a misunderstanding up here. But he does not reward us according to our iniquities. The Bible says so. You must have two or three witnesses. Let us try Job 11.6. And this man endured because he knew this. 11.6 of Job. The last part of the verse. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Know, understand, be sure of this, that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. He doesn't pay you according to what you deserve. Not at all. Job 11.6. And in the New Testament there's another one in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. If you just put these together and think about them frequently, it would help you greatly. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who hath saved us and called us with unholy calling, not according to our works, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Not according to our works. And you must remember these things because we're talking about works and we're judged by our works and rewarded according to our works and it says we're not rewarded according to our works. What's this all about? It's not near as complicated as it sounds. Now, if you will view salvation from the perspective of grace, all have sinned, all are guilty, all need grace. No one dare ask God for what he merits or deserves. If you look at all the parables about works from the perspective of grace, these contradictions will make great sense. And the lessons of Christ will be beautiful to you. Now, if God deals with me according to grace, according to 2 Timothy 1.9, and not according to merit or works, then I have a debt to pay to grace. Literally. Don't worry about this debt very much. Romans 6.14. And if you study this text quite carefully, it literally is saying what I'm trying to tell you. Romans 6 and the 14th verse. For sin shall not have dominion or rulership over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, word under means obligated to, in one sense of the translation. Indebted to. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is this, in very simple language. When Jesus came and lived a righteous life in humanity, he provided righteousness for every human being, the righteousness of the law. What I cannot do, he has done for me. Can Ethiopian change his skin and the leopard his spots? Then can he do good or custom do evil? Since I can't do that, and the Bible teaches that, God in the person of Jesus has done for me what I cannot do. And I am justified by faith in his right doing. And I'm not trying to quibble about righteousness, so don't misunderstand me about that word. But he provides right doing obedience for me. Literally. And I must appropriate that right doing to myself. I must live by faith in his right doing, not in mine. So I'm not judged by my right doing, because he has done it for me. It's Christ which works in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. And it's my cooperation and submission to him that accomplishes any righteousness in my life. Now, as soon as Christ has done this for me and I accept it by faith, does that leave me debt-free? Does that take away all the obligation? It takes away the obligation to the law. And don't misunderstand me about that. Think along clearly with me and wait for me to finish today. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, Christ talked about the obligation of grace. In fact, it's discussed in many places in the New Testament and the Old Testament as well. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, if you'd like to read with me. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now this is not as easy to understand as we think. If I believe that God has forgiven me solely by his grace, with no merit on my part, if I completely trust in that unmerited favor toward me as a guilty person, if I believe in that with all my heart and believe I'm saved because of it, 
then I will treat you the very same way as I believe he's treated me. When you wrong me, I will immediately forgive you even before you ask, because I never want him to treat me according to my merit, so I'll never treat you according to your merit. If you're undeserving, that doesn't make any difference. I gladly forgive because the Lord gladly forgives me when I'm undeserving. And I'm always that way. And because I believe in that undeserving favor manifested to me, I demonstrate this by my treatment of you. Now those are works of grace. You don't deserve it. But I'll treat you that way anyhow. Because I've tasted of his marvelous grace. My whole soul is dependent on his grace. I like it. I love it. I revel in it. It's my only hope. So when you wrong me, you get some of the grace that he's given to me. Very quickly, spontaneously. I like it that way because I never want to be treated the opposite way by him. Now the judgment is looking for works that reveal a character wholly dependent on God's grace. You see, the judgment comes at the end of the kingdom of grace which has existed since Christ came first preaching the kingdom is at hand. It concludes that kingdom. And the judgment is concerning the kingdom of grace. And those who've been found citizens of the kingdom of grace are eligible for the kingdom of glory. Read great controversy about this. So if I've lived by his grace and my works are of grace because of his grace, it'll be very evident in the judgment and there's no problem about it. There are works of merit as well. If you try to merit heaven, you're judged by your works of merit, not by grace. If you insist on trying to deserve it, he said, I'll give you what you deserve. And what do we deserve? Not too pleasant. He said, I'd rather treat you with grace, but if you insist on works of merit, you'll be treated according to your merit. So there are primarily two works in the judgment that God looks at. Have he, has he seen in my life works of grace? or works of merit. If he finds works of grace, I am saved by his precious grace. If he finds works of merit, I'm rewarded according to my merit. And that does some disastrous things for us. We've always thought, you know, that God had electron microscope scrutinizing every human being, you know, and with a fast pencil like a computer, they're writing down everything he finds wrong. And we can only somehow make ourselves absolutely flawlessly perfect so we can find nothing wrong, then we're deserving. Who is conducting that flawless action? A very sinful human being. And he's doing it for selfish reasons. I'd like to suggest to you that God does not look for flawless performance. Flawless performance doesn't make you safe in heaven. I used to teach flying. Flying is a very difficult thing to learn quickly. In fact, you make repeated mistakes and after the longest process, you finally start doing it right. But in my first class of six students, I had a fellow who could exactly do what you did the next time you, he tried it. Exactly. I never saw such a flawless performer as this fellow. His name was Vince. In fact, he was so perfect and he'd never flown before until I had him as a student. He went to primary school and came to me. So I used to tell the other instructors about this guy because my other students were just abominable compared to Vince. They could do nothing right. They'd bounce all the way down the runway. Vince would never do that. Every time, about the first 10 or 15 feet of the runway, he'd put it right down and it stuck right there, you know, just like glue. Every maneuver, just flawless. You just revel in students like this, you know. Isn't that right, you professors? It's so difficult to find them, you know. This guy is uh, eligible for heaven right now. And uh, so I used to brag about this fellow. We had to write grade slips every day on their rides, and I couldn't find one thing wrong with him. And the old veteran instructor said, you better be careful, that fellow. Someday you'll have an accident, and they'll blame you because you've never put down the facts about him. I said, I do put down the facts. You must be crazy. He couldn't have an accident. But the old-timers knew more, and this was my first class, and I was really a greenhorn instructor. So when he came come into land sometimes, I used to kick the stick, bump the throttle, kick a rudder or something, so the airplane would just go skewing down the runway, you know. He never learned how to recover from a bad landing. He never made one until I would, you know, sort of gum things up coming into land. So I used to do all kinds of things just to make it difficult for him to do things right. 
I felt like a stinker doing it. <laughs> but uh, they told me that was the thing to do. I'm not sure they were right at that time. Well, they went on from our school to advanced school there in Arkansas. And the news came back after a month or two that out of all my students, five, you know, were horrible. <laughs> one was way up at the top. Out of all those six students, only one had an accident. Guess who it was? Vince. And I said, that's impossible. And suddenly I could hear those old instructors coming back, you know, like an echo that said, I told you so, I told you so, and I didn't like that. And I wondered why. And at that field, they had a runway that was built on top of the ground, three foot thick concrete, to hold some of the big planes that landed there. Remember now, all my other students, they lucky they hit the middle of the runway. Vince could hit the first 10 feet or 50 feet every time. And for the first time in his life, he came in just a little bit low just slightly, and his wheels hit the end of the red runway like that and folded the gear up underneath the plane and went sliding down the runway. No one was hurt, some damage to the airplane, but it was his perfection that got him into trouble. He was just a hair off because he was following instruction, just a slight underestimation. May I suggest to you that God cannot trust flawless performers in heaven? He cannot. They're still human. They're still prone to error. The ones that God can trust in heaven are those who totally distrust themselves and absolutely trust him for everything. They don't take one step until they hear that still small voice saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And the ones who stumble and fall, stumble and fall, stumble and fall, over and over again, so learn to trust him and distrust self that they're safe. The worst student I had one night had a forced landing in the dark at night from 5,000 feet on a little runway down there in the lights and there's a spotlight shining down about 300 feet down the runway and he had to hit the spotlight in order to tell how high he was. Now to gauge all the way from 5,000 feet circle down and come right down and land that light is a tremendous skill even for an old time instructor. And I came to work one morning and there in the desk of my squadron commander was a note and it said your student last night had a forced landing and landed right on the light. Come back and look at my great tips for him. He failed on forced landings every day. <laughs> and he had for six straight weeks. And someone had told me that, I'd say he's the biggest lie in the world. And they called me in at lunchtime and said, hey, you know, this guy's a sharp student. And I said, it's the first time. <laughs> you just can't explain some of these things. But he had made so many poor forced landings. Under the emergency, he had to get down there. And he probably was frightened stiff. And his gray matter was really in circulation. <laughs> and he made it. The prodigal and his brother are like that. I've done all your commandments, the prodigal's brother said. The other one said, I've done nothing right. Nothing right. You must look at these things very hard and critically or you'll miss something. We are judged by our works. Works of merit or works of grace. Whichever they are, we're rewarded according to them. Either by his grace, if we trust in that, which our works show, or by our merit, which our works show. This is illustrated in Matthew 18 in a fantastic parable that Jesus gave to us. It's the parable of two debtors. One owed 10,000 talents. Some Bibles and some commentators say $6 million. They go up to $12 million. I think the New English, the rather the Living Bible says $10 million, does it? Something like that. 500 pence, the commentary says $18. Some places say $100, $150, a great variety of this. But the debts of the two people is way apart, you know. $6 million to $18, the commentary says. That's a tremendous difference. The king forgave the man of debt, $6 million of debt. You ought to listen to the fellow talk. He said, have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. How much patience does that require? Probably two or three lifetimes. Even for Methuselah, for some of us, you know. You have to live a long time to pay back six million dollars. But the king gladly forgave him the whole thing by his grace. He said, forget about it. Now remember, when you don't pay a debt back, somebody pays it for you. The king was out six million dollars when he said, forget about it. And the king of heaven was out, the priceless son of God. He lost him when he said, forget about the debt. Some people think God is rich, and he is most of the time, but when it came to sons, he only had one. 
and the debt that he could have to forgive us for, if you're a merciful God, he didn't have to, but he did, required that one son. And our sins hit God, for he was the poorest. And it's time we understand that God was not rich when it came to children. And the king said, forget it all. I'll pay it all myself. So this man who owed so much went out and they brought to him one of his debtors who owed him 500 pence, 18 dollars, the commentary says. And he couldn't find, after receiving six million dollars of grace, he couldn't find 18 miserable dollars of grace for that debtor. Couldn't find it in his heart. He said, throw him in jail. The punishment for debtors. So some of the neighbors and friends heard about this. They went to the king in verse 32 of Matthew 18. Then his Lord, after that he called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. He's not trying to be severe here. He's saying, how can you abuse your own flesh and blood? How can you demand out of them payment when I don't demand it from you? How can you be so dictatorial and so exacting and so demanding when I am so merciful and kind and gracious to you? Is your heart so hardened you don't respond to six million dollars with a forgiveness and love and grace? Are you just a rock, you know? Are you like a lion who wants to devour everything? What's wrong with you, the Lord is saying? Are you just fit for destruction? Is that all? Why don't you respond? Why doesn't love come out of your heart when I put so much love down there for you? And that love is for you individually. As you'll find out tonight, the Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Not a bit. It's not his, not his will we should die. So he's long-suffering and he manifests grace by the ten thousands of talents, by the millions of dollars with. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. The Lord bless the Apostle Paul and his superlative language, you know, did much more abound. Not just a little bit. Just overwhelming, just tidal waves of grace. Friends, we'll never finish God's work until we're a church with tidal waves of grace. Never. We'll frighten the world half sick until they're all so guilty they quit and they hate our God because all are sinners. And not until we have this grace abounding. And grace, by the way, is not permissiveness at all. Don't ever think that. Grace brings an obligation. Permissiveness has no obligation. When God is so gracious to us. He says, now you have a debt to pay that you can pay. You couldn't pay the debt to the law. I paid it. But now you have a debt of grace to pay. And what is that debt? To be gracious unto others who are wholly undeserving like you. That's what he expects. Can't you love somebody? Can't you be kind to them when they wrongfully use you? When the Lord's been so kind to you already? Can't you understand why we're so prone to sin? Why we say evil things? Why we lose our tempers and do all this? Can't you understand? Aren't you a sinner too? The God who never sinned understands us. Why can't we understand each other? Why are we so critical, you know? So nasty about these things? Why do we make life so unbearable by our exactions, our demands? Saying, jump higher and I can't even jump this high yet, you know? Why do we do that? The Lord doesn't do it. So in this marvelous judgment, you see, the Lord is looking at our works to see how much I believe in his grace. If in my works he finds kindness to you when you're not deserving, patience with those who do not deserve patience, help to the fatherless, the widows, those in prison, Jesus names them all, you know, understanding and compassion, that heart melted with love and grace for other sinners because they're just like we are. When he finds that, he says, Come be blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom. 
When he doesn't find that, he finds those who say, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Haven't we done all these works in your name? He says to me and to you, depart from me. I never knew you. You can't deserve my kingdom. Only those who believe in my grace understand me, love me. They manifest this by their works. Let's go back to the prodigal's brother, shall we? In Luke 15, verse 29, he said, I have never transgressed your law. I worked all these years. You never did anything for me. What's he really saying? Father, treat me according to what I deserve. And the father says, I am. Right? I am. You'll have no feast. You'll get your wages. But you'll have no feast. You're working for merit. You don't trust in my grace. I'll just give you your wages. But listen to his brother in verse 21 of Luke 15, in a marvelous verse, and this is why I say the guilty are blessed. 15:21, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. Oh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the father threw his robe around him so no one could see him in that filthy condition. He took him home and gave him a bath shaved him, cleaned him all up, fixed up his hair. When he looked spotless, the father had done it for him. Then he called in all the guests and all the friends and he said, come and make merry with me for my son who was dead in trespass and sin is now alive. Rejoice with me. Be happy. He's come back from the dead. Doesn't that make you happy? When I come home to Jesus, And I say, I'm a sinner, forgive me. He said, I'm so happy you're home. I'm so happy. And he throws that robe of righteousness around me. And he cleans me all up. And then presents me. And he said, to all of heaven, rejoice with me. The one who was lost and dead is found. But to those who say, Father, I've kept all your commandments. i worked all these years. You never did anything for me. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. I pray that you'll get these things straightened out in your mind. The judgment is a marvelous, marvelous thing. It's the climax of the whole kingdom of grace. As God looks at all the candidates of grace, all the citizens of grace, and he sees how out of response to a a God of love, they love other souls with grace abounding. And the Lord says to them, well done, because of works of grace. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. May God grant every one of us to understand the difference of works of merit and works of grace. Let us stand for prayer.